Welcome to our Seven Last Sayings of Christ. I'm excited to introduce you to many ministers of our church who will be sharing about the seven last sayings of Christ on the cross. This is a great time for us to hear the heart of Christ and understand what it meant as he was on the cross sharing with the seven last sayings. So we're going to begin today with my wife, Carol Hardy, with the first saying of Christ. So as we begin, let's bring ourselves to the scene of exactly what is going on. There is an intensity in the air as you hear the jeering and the crying of the crowd. Many people have gathered to watch as three men have their hands and their feet nailed to a cross and are now hanging there. The two men on the sides are criminals deserving of their punishment. But then our focus comes to the man in the middle, a humble, innocent, compassionate man, Jesus. He's so loving and so compassionate that over the noise of the crowd, Jesus speaks, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Why would he say forgive them? Do you realize that just hours before, Jesus had been rejected by those close to him, abused physically beyond measure, almost unrecognizable. He was mocked, and now he's being humiliated to the fullest. Yet in his pain and agony, Jesus chooses to ask his Father to forgive all those who have wronged him. Forgiveness? What is it? It's letting go of the anger and the desire to punish someone who has done you wrong. It's giving up the right to get even. It's trusting the Lord enough to know he's got you and he's got that person. Forgiveness is not waiting for someone else to ask for it or even to deserve it. Forgiveness is a releasing of the person, releasing the person for what they owe. Jesus, was, Jesus wasn't asking forgiveness just for those of that day, but he was also asking for all those yet to come, including you and me. Have you accepted Jesus as your one and only? Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins and made him Lord of your life? If you have it, then let today be the day that you become his child. Even in Jesus' pain and anguish, he thought of others. He is so compassionate that his first words on the cross were, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus knew the rulers and the people didn't totally understand what was going on. They didn't totally understand the wickedness that they were taking part in. They were blinded spiritually. And all this time they missed what all this time they missed what Jesus was trying to teach and show them. Yet Jesus had a love for them. For they know not what they do. Yes, the rulers and soldiers and the people were blinded. They didn't totally understand that Jesus was the Messiah. But today we have no reason to be blinded. We have the cross, we have the Bible, and the Holy Spirit to keep us from being that way. Are you blinded spiritually? You don't have to be. Let us not miss what Jesus is leading us to do because we're not looking to him or because we are afraid to do what he is, wants us to do. Are you allowing Jesus' glory to shine in your life? Or are you still rejecting him? Are you allowing his fullness to shine through you? Or are you still hanging him on the cross? If you have never given Jesus a chance, may today be the day that you receive his forgiveness. Let today be the day that you receive Vision 2020. Don't be included in the, for they not, know not what they do. That is not an excuse. There's still eternal punishment for not doing what you are supposed to do. Today, get your heart right with the Lord and others. Then let's do what we're supposed to do, bring glory to him. It is a joy for me today to be able to teach on one of the final sayings of Jesus from the cross. Jesus promised a man beside him who was also being crucified. He said, today you shall be with me in paradise. 
Jesus was crucified between two thieves. Uh, this is a fulfillment of a prophecy given in Isaiah saying that he was numbered with the transgressors. Jesus was numbered with the transgressors, two, two guilty men on either side of him also being crucified. I believe these two men, these two thieves, both of them were guilty, uh, both of them sentenced to death. Uh, I believe they represent all of the human race, all of the world. I believe all of us were there in this moment. And, and like the two thieves, so it is with us today. Some of us are repentant and, and some or not. Some will harden. Um, he said, you shall be with me in paradise. Um, paradise, without going into too much detail, paradise was a holding place uh, for people who died um, in the Old Testament. The Old Testament saints, the righteous dead, uh, but they could not go to heaven. It was a holding place, uh, and no one could go to heaven unless you hear and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what happened? They were held there in paradise, not a place of torment, but a, a good place until Jesus got there. When did Jesus get there? When he was crucified in between uh, the moment when he gave up his last breath and the resurrection. The Bible teaches us that he descended into the lower parts of the earth to preach to the spirits held captive there. G what did he preach? He preached himself. He preached the gospel. I can't imagine anyone rejecting him uh, in paradise. He moved those, and they repented, they accepted the gospel, and he moved paradise to heaven. But these two thieves represent all of the world. You know, the Bible really is a story of two. I've taught this many times. The Bible is a story of two, uh, and it all, it's always a contrast, and it's always giving us a choice. The choice is ours. Choose you this day whom you shall serve. Uh, there's good and evil, there's blessing and cursing, there's light, darkness, there's right versus wrong, there's life and death, there's the, 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 the broad way, the narrow way, uh, there's the wheat and the tares, uh, there's the sheep and the goats, the flesh man, the spirit man. The Bible is a story of two. It's our choice. There's Cain and Abel, and we can be like Cain or we can be like Abel. The choice is ours. Uh, two offerings, one was accepted, one was not. There's Abraham and Lot. Uh, a, a contrast there. Abraham was a man of excellence and achieved great things for God. Lot was a man of mediocrity. Mediocre, he never achieved anything for the Lord. Uh, so it is with us today, our choice. Uh, uh, Jacob and Esau, two twins in their mother's womb. There's uh, Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac is the promised child. He represents what God can do. Ishmael is, uh, he represents what man can do. There's um, King David, King Saul. King David, God's choice. King Saul, the people's choice. Both of them guilty. Both of them sinned. What was the difference? David repented when he was confronted with his sin. Saul was hardened until the very end. Uh, two friends of Jesus, two, two ladies, Mary and Martha. Mary was a worshiper. Martha was a worrier. What are you today? The choice is ours. The Bible is a story of two, these two thieves. One got saved and received the Lord. One believed not and hardened his heart until the very end. The man said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, that's a prayer of, for mercy. It's a prayer of humility. Uh, it's a prayer of recognizing him as king and Messiah. But one thing he was a little bit off about. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In his mind, the kingdom was way off, distant, far out, a long time from now. That's why he said, don't forget me, Lord. Remember me. Don't forget me when you come into your kingdom a long time from now. But Jesus says today, verily, verily, I say unto you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Can I tell you today that salvation is for today? Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Salvation is not for distant. It's not for something way off from now. 
It's not for tomorrow. It's not for next week. Salvation is always presented as a present day decision. Do not put it off today. Uh, uh, the Bible said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Uh, Joshua, was it Joshua who said, uh, choose you this day whom you shall serve. Salvation is for now. Salvation is near. Today, we, all of us, just like these two thieves, we're all guilty, but we all have an opportunity, a blessed opportunity to hear the voice of God, to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's urgent. Don't put that choice off. Don't put it off for tomorrow. Make the right choice. Make that right choice today. Salvation is now. Salvation is near. Who's on the Lord's side? Who's on the Lord's side? Choose Jesus today. Choose life over death. Uh, don't put it off. Choose Him today. You can be with Him, not only just in paradise, but you can be with Him in heaven today. May God richly bless you. It's been a joy to hear the ministers as they have been speaking about the seven last saints of Christ. The one that I have is found in John chapter 19, verse 25 to 27. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. For that time on, this disciple took her into his home. You see, this is a little bit different saying than the others that we heard. Some of them were done out of necessity, maybe dealing with the thief on the cross. Some was done out of fulfillment of prophecy. But this shows the humanity of Jesus. Jesus provides for his mother at his death. What bigger thing to do, what greater thing to do in humanity but to provide for someone in your family? It's encouraging to me to know that Jesus took time as he's there. Jesus took time on the cross to provide for his mother. As I began to ponder this passage, I began to think about what Jesus was going through. Just earlier, as we look, we see that Jesus was suffering in the garden, and he began to, to as so in prayer intensely so much that, that his sweat became his blood. We see next the betrayal of his friend, Judas, his disciple. We see next, as he's there and he's beaten, and we see also the scourging, and we, see, we hear the mockery. So we can imagine the pain that Jesus is going through as, as he's journeying to the cross. You can imagine what it must have felt like to put the crown of thorns on his head. And in all this, this suffering, and all of this being nailed to the cross, and all of this being mocked and torn out on the cross, in all of this, he thought about his mother. It shows us his compassion. It shows us how compassionate Jesus is, how much he loves, how much he cares, how much he necessarily thought it so important to help his family. But it also reminds me of how much he cares for me and how much he cares for you, how much he has so much compassion. Sometimes, let's be honest, we get caught so much into our own suffering, so much into what's happening to us that we forget to look around us. We forget to see why we're there. We forget to, to impact those and the people around us. We forget about those that are around us. We forget about their own needs and their own suffering. So it's incredible to see what happens here. And then the next part that, that, I, that, that I see in this passage is Jesus gives this responsibility over to John. Where was John? John was at the foot of the cross. Mary was at the foot of the cross. And because John was at the foot of the cross, he had, now has a responsibility. Can I tell you, it's at the foot of the cross where we find the responsibility that God gives us. If you want to know God's will, go to the foot of the cross. If you want to know God's purpose for your life, go to the foot of the cross. As you meet Jesus at the foot of the cross, he'll give you purpose. He'll give you hope. He'll change your life. But it happens at the foot of the cross. It happens at that moment where we're being obedient and we're looking unto Jesus. It happens at that moment where we, where we see Christ as who he is. See, John was at the foot of the cross. And because God found him faithful, God gave him a faithful duty. What bigger responsibility for John than to take care of the mother of Jesus? 
But one more thought as I'm here, and this is what really got my attention. As I began to focus at the foot of the cross, God did something. God put two families together. God took John and God took Mary and he created this family together at the foot of the cross. God gave them the responsibility, but he created this family, this new family. You know, history says that it was 11, 12, 13 years later that Mary, before she died, she continued to live with John. And the Bible says she went home with him. I don't know what happened to her sons and her daughters. I don't know why they didn't take the responsibility there. It could be because they were not at the foot of the cross. It could be because they did not believe. It could be so much more. Because honestly, when you look at these scriptures, Mary, it was a long time. I mean, it's actually until after Jesus' resurrection that she really understood what was happening here. And maybe that's what the reason, I don't know. But God took John and he took Mary and he melded this, this family together. And I love this quote. Let me just read this quote to you. A family is formed at the foot of the cross because that's where true families are forged and held together. And I read that quote and I was like, wow. If you want to know how to keep your family together, bring them to the foot of the cross. If you want to know how to hold on to your family, bring them to the foot of the cross. During this Easter season, during this time when we think about the resurrection and we think about the crucifixion of Christ, I encourage you to take your family and bring them to the foot of the cross. Bring them and introduce them to Jesus or let them see Jesus. Let them see Christ in you. When you're at the foot of the cross, it's amazing the responsibility, but it's amazing the opportunities that God gives you. Oftentimes people ask me, how can I keep my family together? How can I bring my family together? How can I lead my family to Christ? Let me tell you, you lead them to the foot of the cross. You let them see you at the foot of the cross. You let them see you worshiping and honoring and obeying Christ. And when you do that, I'm telling you, they have no other choice but to follow you there. It's at the foot of the cross where lives are changed. It's at the foot of the cross where families come together. It's at the foot of the cross where we see the humanity of Christ. And I encourage you this week, as you walk through this week, just remember, stay at the foot of the cross. God bless you. Happy Easter, Langley Church of God family and friends. He's risen. He has risen. And I'm here to speak to you today about the last sayings Jesus had when he was on the cross. And mine comes from Matthew 27, 46. It's also mentioned Mark 15 and 34. And it reads like this. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Elama Sabathani, which means, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And this is the only saying that appears in more than one gospel. Again, I said it came from Matthew 27, 46 and Mark 15, 34. And it's also a quote from Psalms 22. This saying is taken by some as an abandonment of the Son by the Father. Another interpretation holds that the moment when Jesus took upon himself our sins, the sins of humanity, the Father had to turn away from the Son because the Father is of pure eyes and to see evil and cannot look at wrong. That's according to Habakkuk 1 and 13. Now other theologians understand that it's a cry as truly a a true human who was forsaken, put to death by his foes, very largely deserted by his friends, and he may have felt also deserted by his by God, his Father. Now, others point to this verse, uh, these words from Psalms 22, that suggest that maybe Jesus recited these words, perhaps even the whole Psalm, that he might show himself to be the very being to whom these words refer to. So the Jews and scribes might look and examine why he would not descend from the cross. Namely because this psalm showed that it was appointed that he should suffer all these things for us. Now theologian Frank Stagg points to what he calls a mystery of Jesus' incarnation. He who died at Golgotha or Calvary is the one who the Father, that God was in Christ, and that at the same time he cried out to the Father. Now while the nails were in his wrists, 
They put pressure on this large median nerve, the one that runs from the middle of our wrist down into our hand. And that severely damaged nerve causes such excruciating pain. The Lamb of God experiences the pain, the abandonment of his soul by his Father. A deeply excruciating pain is the essence of eternal, eternal condemnation for our sins. So he was experiencing this pain not only by being taken on our sins and the sins of all humanity. Think about that. That's from beginning to whenever the end is. And he took on all those sins. Not only that, his father, he felt abandoned by his father because of our sins, because of the sins he took upon him. And then all the pain he was experiencing from the human standpoint from the damage done to his flesh. We should be so grateful for our God. And take time to go back and read through these scriptures about the crucifixion of Jesus and know that that pain and all that he suffered was for us, was for you and for me, that we may have relationship with God again. That's the whole purpose. Jesus came to have relationship with us. I love you. And I do say Happy Easter again. And God has risen from the grave. The seven last sayings of Christ, I want to talk to you for a few minutes about our thirst. In John chapter 19, verse 28, it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And this, um, and this saying, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy that was found in Psalms 69 and 21, for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Jesus also demonstrated that he understands human pain and understands our hurting and our physical needs too. In John 4 and 14, it reads, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. When Jesus said, I am thirsty, in the final moments of his eternal life, his words were so much more than just an expression of physical need. He was expressing our need, a thirst that only Jesus can satisfy. Jesus desires us to not only satisfy our thirst with him, but he also desires to grow us until we respond to the needs of others. Jesus wants each and every single one of us to be a life giver and help meet the needs of those that thirst for him. A perfect example of this is in John chapter 4 when Jesus encountered a Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus didn't reveal who he was to many people, but he did to this woman. And it teaches us something about thirst. Jesus' thirst is that we would receive his life, and then in turn, we would become a life giver to other people. He desires us to give life to others just as he did to this Samaritan woman at the well. Love becomes the centerpiece of our life when we do this and when we go, go from being the needy to the needed. First of all, I'd like to say hello to my church family, Langley Church of God, and wish you a very blessed Easter season. I miss being together with my church family and worshiping together as a church, and I consider it a privilege to be a part in this Good Friday celebration. With that said, I now begin. It is finished. John 19 and 30, when Jesus had therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. With these words, Jesus announced the end of his earthly life and ministry. Jesus, the word, had come to earth to do the will of his father. And now it is finished. Hebrews 10, 5 through 7. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. But a body hast thou prepared me. 
In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. It is finished. The promised Redeemer of mankind that would put the power of sin under his feet has come, and it is finished. Romans 5, 12, 18, and 19. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. The one who would destroy the works of the devil has come, and it is finished. 1 John 3 and 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. He has come. He has manifested himself. He has destroyed the works of the devil, and it is finished, paid in full. All types and shadows pointing to Christ, all the promises concerning him, all of the prophecies about his birth, his ministry, his miracles, his life, and his sufferings in death, are now finished. His perfect obedience is now finished. Luke twenty two forty one forty two, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Hebrews 5 and 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Christ's work of redemption, paying the price for our sin on the cross, is finished. Christ's work of atonement, whereby the exchange has taken place, is finished. To, and to all who will receive him, his righteousness is credited to our account, and our sin is placed on him and judged. What an exchange. Colossians two thirteen and 14. And you, being dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The atonement that brings about our reconciliation to God is finished. The Apostle Paul, speaking by the Holy Spirit, says in 2 Corinthians five twenty and 21, Now, then, ye are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The works of Satan have been defeated by Jesus' work on the cross, and it is finished. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty-five through 57 O death! Where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The debt is paid in full. God's plan of salvation is accomplished. It is finished. Hello to everybody. I imagine you're kind of like me. Uh, you're not uh, 
very happy with the fact that we can't be together, especially on Easter or Easter service at the church. I want to say a little prayer before we get started. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord God, for all your many blessings. And Lord, even though we're not able to be together uh, in a unit inside of the house of God, Lord, we know that we're the body of Christ. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for keeping us all well and safe. And Lord God, we pray the blood of Jesus over all of your children. Lord, that we may all be kept free from sickness, disease, harm, hurt, and death. And soon be back together, Lord God, with fellowship. And Lord God, let us have this fellowship with you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk about the last words that Jesus said. And I'm thankful that I have the very last one. Uh, it was very good. And I want to start by going off uh, with this. I'm just going to read this off of the page. By the words with which he breathed out his soul, Jesus had cried with a loud voice. When he said, Why hast thou forsaken me? So we are told in Matthew and Mark, and it should seem it was with a loud voice he said this too. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Let's remember that word commend. It's not command, but commend. <clears throat> he borrowed these words from his father David in Psalms 31 and 5. Christ died with scripture in his mouth. In this address to God, he calls him Father. Yet when he complained of being forsaken, he called him Eli, Eli, my God, my God. That dreadful agony of his soul was now over. He here calls God Father. Christ made use of these words in a sense, particularly to himself, as mediator. He was now to make his, soul, make his soul an offering for our sins. Isaiah 53 and 10, you can find that. To give his life a ransom for many. You can find that in Matthew 20 and 28. Now by these words he offers up the sacrifice. Did as it were, lay his hand upon the head of it and surrender it. I deposit it, he said. I pay it down into thy hands, Father. Accept my life and my soul instead of the lives and the souls of the sinners I die for. The goodwill of the offer was requisite to the acceptance of the offering. And I want to touch on that word requisite. It means the thing that is necessary for the achievement of a specific end. That's another thing that was already planned by God. He, Jesus, commends his spirit into his Father's hands to be received into paradise and return the third day. Now, I want to go to that word commend. And it, the, this is the way that it's presented. Presented as suitable for approval or acceptance. But it can also mean to entrust someone or something. Two, and this is this is what I put together. Jesus was entrusted to present a suitable and acceptable sacrifice to the Father's approval. You know, Jesus gave us many things that we can live by, and many things also that we can die by. Christ has fitted these words of David to the purpose of dying saints, and has, as it were, sanctified them. For this use we must show that we are freely willing to die that we are firmly believing in another life after this saying father into thy hands I commend my spirit to be willing to live for Christ and to be willing to die for Christ that's what Jesus showed us he showed us that by his sacrifice, he gave his life, he gave everything that he had so that we could have salvation. I hope you have a wonderful and a blessed Easter. I love you and can't wait till we can all get back together. In Jesus' name, I bless you. Amen.